I'm Rene Ritchie, and I'm just gonna run all the perfunctory benchmarks, like the stonks of benchmarks, on the brand new M1, Apple Silicon, Mac Mini, MacBook Air, and MacBook Pro, and I'm gonna do it right now. Okay, so now, real talk. I've been switching between these three new M1 machines for about three days now. So this is all super preliminary and super superficial, but if you're trying to make a decision now, 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 I'm gonna give you my first impressions. And keep in mind, while I'm saying this, M1 is the first and therefore the worst Mac silicon Apple is ever gonna ship. It's analogous to Intel's Y series, at least on the surface, designed for ultra low power systems, prioritizing efficiency as in battery life. And the performance is not really, but kinda incidental. And there will be both more powerful chips for bigger Mac systems this generation and future generations of all of these chips beyond this first set. So keep this as a baseline, just in the back of your minds, because, <laughs> They're about to be blown. So let's compare the eight gigabyte M1 MacBook Air to the 16 gigabyte Intel 10th gen Y series MacBook Air, the 16 gigabyte two port M1 MacBook Pro to the 16 gigabyte four port Intel 10th generation U series MacBook Pro. And yes, that is a higher end system, but it's all I had handy. And frankly, Intel needs just all the advantages it can get here. And also the eight gigabyte M1 Mac mini to the eight gigabyte Intel 8th gen U series Mac mini. And all of these Macs just max out at 16 gigabytes of LP DDR4X RAM, but so do the systems they're replacing or at least reintroducing. And Apple is good enough with memory compression, ultra fast swap and other mitigations that for these types of ultra low power entry level systems, it's really a non-issue. Also, the Intel Macs all have Apple T2 coprocessors on board, which are basically A10 chipsets. And that will help them with things like H.264 and 265 encode and decode. So for some of these tests, it's not even a fair fight. Intel does have some advantages here. So what are the results? For Geekbench 5, which is a really popular synthetic benchmark, it was still legitimately surprising. The M1 chips in all the Macs performed almost identically, which in and of itself is no surprise because it's a short enough test that it didn't even cause any of the fans to kick on. And M1, M1 just trounced all the Intel versions. Single core better, multi-core and metal just way, way better. And single core in general on these chips, on these M1 chips is just ridiculous. It's pure beast mode, like better than anything else on the market up to what AMD is probably just releasing now. For multi-core and compute, you can get other systems with just way more cores and way bigger graphics still. But again, these are low power parts. Running Aztec 1440p in GFX Bench Metal, which is another synthetic benchmark, but gives a good indicator for basic gaming performance. Again, the M1 Max just all performed almost identically, even though this test runs longer. There just wasn't much, if any, ramping down. And they just MDK'd the Intel. And the Intel Air fan was just blazing. The Intel Pro fan was audible, but not that loud. And the M1 Air has no fan. The M1 Pro and Mini the fans didn't even come on. And the M1 Mini just ran laps around the Intel Mini and then danced center field waiting for that Mini to catch up. Cinebench, which is from the Cinema 4D people and is just industry standard for CPU flexing, for single core, it was still identical across the M1 Max and still no fan for the Pro or Mini, even though they were one and a half times faster than the Intel versions. For multi-core single run, basically the same thing, but the Intel Air was just <laughs> ground and pounded. Instead of one and a half times like the rest, the M1 Air was more like two times faster. For multi-core 10 minute mode, we got the M1 Air finally ramping down for the first time and got actual proof of life on there being a fan in the M1 Pro. Not so much as a peep though still from the M1 Mini fan. Meanwhile, Intel fans were all just <laughs> screaming in their hearts. That did mean the Intel Air didn't ramp down, but honestly, there was just not that much down for it to ramp. 
the M1 Air was still more than two times faster, even when it was ramping down, and the M1 Pro was still one and a half times faster than the higher level machine. Now, I run these benchmarks because everyone's gonna be asking for them, and they're gonna be people who run far more detailed benchmarks than I do, so I'll link to them in the description below. For me, the most important thing is never the benchmark, it is the time to completed work. And by that I mean, I get footage into Final Cut Pro, I edit it, the time it takes me to do that until I am uploading it to YouTube. That to me is the important thing and measures a bunch of quantitative and qualitative things that are just beyond what any benchmark measures. And I am editing this video, the one you're watching now on the M1 Pro, but I need to point out that the Canon 10-bit XF AVC codec that I'm using requires Rosetta even in the M1 native version of Final Cut Pro just to get that footage to show up. And I still have to run all the emulation tests in general as well. Now, that's all fine and perfy, but here's the part that starts to make the mind just well and truly blown. First, the M1 Max stay way, way, way just to the nth degree way cooler than the Intel Max. Like the Intel Mac Mini during these tests could keep your coffee warm while the M1 Mini stayed just cool to the touch. And legit, the only area of regression that I found is heat generation. If you do wanna use your Mac Mini to keep your coffee warm or your MacBook Pro as a heat blanket alternative, then you are going to have to stick with Intel because the M1 Apple Silicon versions are just cool as LLJ. Second, and most importantly for me, battery life. With the obvious exception of the Mac Mini, which is plugged in, all the MacBook tests were run purely on battery, just zero plugs. From beginning to end, starting everything at 100%, after all of those tests, the Intel Air was down to 40% battery life, while the M1 Air was still at 64%. The Intel Pro was down to 27% battery life, while the M1 Pro was still at 70%, which is fine when I'm just thinking about working from home, while watching virtual events on the television and making my own damn coffee. But when I think about life after the world stops ending and I'm traveling again and bouncing between airports and hotels and venues and yeah, coffee shops, the ability to write and record and edit and render and upload with that much battery, just that often, that all the time, is going to be transformative. Like literally transformative as in changing the way that I will be able to do my work. And I imagine that will be true for a lot of people across a wide range of types of work. As to the 720p webcams, now with M1 image signal processing, which is basically A14 iPhone 12 level image signal processing, as well as the Air's mics and Pro studio quality mics, here's how those compare to the previous and other current generation Macs. This is the M1 MacBook Air 720p webcam and microphones. This is the M1 13 inch MacBook Pro 720p webcam and studio quality microphones. This is the camera and microphone on the 2016 12 inch MacBook. This is the microphone and camera on the 2017 15 inch MacBook Pro. This is the 2019 16 inch MacBook Pro camera and microphone. This is a 2017 iMac Pro camera and microphone. This is a Logitech 920 1080p camera and microphone. This is a Logitech 4K Brio camera and microphone. This is a 2020 MacBook Air microphone and camera. This is the 2020 12.9 inch iPad Pro front facing camera and microphone. This is the iPhone 12 4K true depth camera and ridiculous microphones. This is a new 27 inch iMac 1080p camera and microphone. This is the 2020 13 inch MacBook Pro camera and microphone. This is the M1 MacBook Air 720p webcam and microphones. This is the M1 13 inch MacBook Pro 720p webcam and studio quality microphones. Now, all of this being said, all the performance, all the battery life, the one thing for me, the weird thing that just kept going through my head the entire time these tests were running wasn't even battery life, but it was quality of life. With single core performance like this, it just makes everything feel immediately responsive. Like that feeling you get when you use an iPad. The reason everybody wants Final Cut Pro on an iPad, this is delivering right now. And I can't talk about all the apps yet, but the lack of waiting 
for things to happen. And the absolute lack of beach balls so far feels like it's giving me slices of my life back. Like all those little interstitial things, all those times I have to wait or frames don't render or beach balls do pop up, all of those things add up to yes, a few seconds at a time, but a few minutes over the course of an hour and probably an hour or more over the course of the week. And battery life is great, but this literally feels like it's giving me those pieces of my life back. And yes, these are brand new, completely clean machines. So it remains to be seen how that sort of feeling sustains, persists over time. But if it's anything like the iPad, I do not expect it to change like at all. And the efficiency means that even on the machines with fans, those fans stay off or quieter longer, which means less noise. And sure, you get used to the noise, but there is nothing like the feeling of suddenly noticing there is no noise. In terms of quality of life, that is just another significant improvement. But again, these are the low power, low end, entry level Macs, all of them. So while Perf is amazing, based on this Perf, the next round will be even better. So unless you have money to burn or devices that you just wanna to get to use now, now, now and hand off later, you shouldn't buy the wrong Mac just to have an M1 Mac. But for low power machines, especially the Air, M1 just removes so many of the previous bottlenecks and compromises, it is absolutely astonishing. So if you have just always been interested in a MacBook Air, what you're getting with this MacBook Air, the performance, the battery life, the lack of a fan, the quality of life, for the same price as the previous Intel Mac is just what I said at the beginning, ridiculous. For the MacBook Pro, you are getting better performance and way better battery life than even the higher end, more expensive Intel systems gave you yesterday. And for the Mac mini, you're getting a cheaper option at the lower end. If you just want a small silver box with entry level MacBook Pro performance that you can throw on any TV or display or use to glue together any production process. And that ends up being just a tremendous increase in value. Yes, the performance is amazing. The battery life is amazing. The quality of life improvements are something I'm gonna be talking about for a long time. But at a basic monetary level, the value provided by all of these low power entry level systems today is just significantly more than it was on the same models yesterday. I'll have full reviews up as soon as inhumanly possible. So hit the subscribe button and then jump into the comments and let me know exactly what you wanna see. And if you have any more questions or just wanna chat about any of this, check out my members only Discord where we talk Mac, Apple Silicon, iPhones, iPads, watches, gear, workflows, and so much more. You can find it on Patreon. Yes, I have Patreon now, patreon.com slash Rene Ritchie. I set it up right after I quit my big media job back in March, back before 2020, and I started this new channel. And it's great because there's a whole preview section where I share ideas and outlines for videos or ask you for questions for Q&A videos, sometimes early versions of the videos before they go live, longer versions of interviews when they're available, like 45 minute long versions. And there are even ways to get your name into the description of every video, even the credits, to be more involved in this community and contribute directly to the creation of these videos and future projects like my podcast, Apple Talk with Georgia Dow, check out patreon.com slash Renee Ritchie or just click the link in the description. And clicking on that link really helps out the channel. For a ton more on Apple Silicon Max, click on the playlist above. I'm doing in-depth analysis, reviews, and so much more to come. Click the playlist and I'll see you next video.